Hello and welcome to what is certainly going to be a gigantic damage report. I'm John Adarola. Uh, we've got a big show. I mean, not only do we have the uh, the Senate confirmation hearings and questioning of uh, William Barr going on literally as we speak, and we will be checking in on those throughout the show to see if anything big happens. And it probably will because there's a number of people who are gonna be asking him questions who are likely to run for president. So as always with these confirmations, people are gonna be looking to make some news. And so we will be checking to see if that actually happens. We're gonna start off with a bit of that, some big quotes. It's been going on for a couple of hours now at this point, but there's lots more going on in the news as well. I mean, not only do we have Donald Trump spreading some fairly significant and easily disprovable lies, about undocumented immigrants in America. We also have the first numbers on his address to the nation last week. How many minds did he actually change? You are gonna be, well, perhaps not shocked, but you might be pleased at the results. So we're gonna break that down a little bit later on. Um, then if there's time, uh, his attacks against Elizabeth Warren, representatives of uh, various Native American tribes and governing councils have now spoken out against his most recent tweets. Um, so we'll have a little bit of that for you. We're gonna close out the show, assuming there's time, with a, a Gillette ad. Uh, we like to cover razors once to twice per week on this show. Um, and this time it has to do with American masculinity. And they put out an ad that has driven everyone insane. So I will be responding to that. But along the way, two awesome guests are also gonna be joining us. So in just a little bit, on in the next block, uh, Desmond Mead, who led the charge for uh, the Florida amendment that just went into effect, that gave the right to vote to those with felonies who have served their sentences, will be joining the show, breaking down how that came to be and where we go from here. And a little bit later on, we're gonna be talking with one of the teachers who is currently in the streets right now, striking in LA, part of the massive over 30,000 strong teacher strike in LA. That she's gonna be joining us and breaking down what it is that the teachers are actually asking for. So, so much to get to, why don't we jump right into it. Donald Trump's proposed new AG is William P. Barr, who we've talked about previously on the show. We're not gonna run through all of his experience, but you should know that he's a longtime lawyer who previously served as Attorney General under George H.W. Bush back in the early 90s. Um, did some things that got him positive press at the time, also some controversial moves as well. More recently, he got into the news over the past couple of years because he has occasionally weighed in on the Robert Mueller investigation, including uh, authoring a memo that was fairly critical critical of the investigation, but I am sure that that did not enter into the top 20 list of reasons that Donald Trump is nominating him to be the AG. It wasn't like that was one of his big issues with Jeff Sessions or anything like that, his recusal from that probe. In any event, he is now before the Senate, and he's been undergoing a couple hours of questioning as of this filming that continues. But I wanna break down some of the things that came up during that questioning. The first, which is fairly large, and it's the first of a couple of things where he clearly diverges from Donald Trump, is he says, I don't believe Mueller would be involved in a witch hunt. Um, that is significant because of course the president for like two years now has been saying, or close to two years, I know it hasn't been going on for two years, has been saying that uh, Robert Mueller is heading up a team of 11 or 16 or 19 angry Democrats. It's a uh, deep state plot to end his presidency. They haven't found anything and they are being driven by partisan animus and nothing more. Well, William Barr is saying that he does not believe that that is the case, which certainly sounds good on paper, if this is a guy that hypothetically could end the investigation or interfere with the investigation, stop its findings from coming out, you would want him to not be biased against it. But in relation to that quote and the quotes that will follow, I want you to bear in mind one important question that will come out of this hearing that we have going on today. Does anything matter at all? Because I saw one of the Krasenstein brothers on Twitter, they are reliably, they provide bad takes on pretty much everything, said, he was asked, Barr was asked, would you shut down the Mueller investigation? And he said, no, I can't conceive of that happening. And they were like, we've got it. Now if they do it, we will show this video, it will be golden. It might be golden, it might feel a little bit better, but it doesn't necessarily stop the investigation from being shut down. And the thing is, if you say something, if you say something specific, if you say something specific on video, in past years, sure, some sense of normal or even political shame would stop you from directly contradicting yourself in an obvious fashion because you would not want it pointed out that you were a hypocrite on important matters. 
but it's 2019 and I don't know that that really exists anymore. So there's gonna be a lot of good quotes here, but I can't say that it really matters. Whether we're talking about the Mueller investigation or Barr's approach to um, yeah, civil rights and a variety of other issues where there are serious concerns about what he would actually represent as AG. But we'll continue uh, with more questions, just bear all that in mind. So uh, Senator Leahy asked him, you were very critical of the Russia probe. I can't think of anything that would jump out more for this president because of his commitment to it. Some have said on both sides of the aisle that it looked like a job application, referring to the memo that we talked about. And Barr responds, that's ludicrous. I don't think it necessarily qualifies as ludicrous, but I understand why he would want to disarm that attack. Because it's gonna come up very often during uh, these talks. He defended it as entirely proper that he had sent it. I think. If a lawyer who had previously served as AG wanted to send an unsolicited memo to the White House attacking an investigation of the presidency, I don't think that you know without additional information there's anything wrong with that or improper about that. But if you were then chosen to be the next AG by a president that has shown to value loyalty and submission to his will, you know, in matters political and ethical and legal and all that. That might be improper. So he wasn't necessarily doing anything wrong by sending the memo, assuming it wasn't consciously a thing that he was doing to get the position. But being chosen for the position afterward could make us, at the very least, question Donald Trump's motives in choosing him. If not, you know what role Barr would actually play were he to get that position. So uh, uh, getting into more specific matters, uh, Leahy asked uh, whether the president can pardon someone in return for not testifying against him. And William Barr says that would be a crime. So that is again a very specific thing that addresses a concern that people have had considering the various ways that Donald Trump has arguably tampered with uh, witnesses already for months and months talking about the possibility of floating pardons, calling certain people testifying against him rats, all of that. He's now saying that if you were to pardon someone so that they didn't testify against you, that would be a crime. But I'm not sure that anything matters. So we'll see how much that's actually worth in the end. Uh, moving on, Leahy asked about Rudy Giuliani's remarks that the president should be able to quote, correct Mueller's final report before a possible public release. Uh, he asked Barr uh, whether he will commit to that not happening, and Barr says that will not happen. So again, very specific. And again, who knows if it actually matters. Uh, Barr on whether Trump will be allowed to take the Mueller report and put his own spin on it before it's released, that will not happen. So two versions of sort of the same thing. Will Rudy Giuliani be able to redact the memo before people see it? Or will Trump be able to preempt it with his own version, Barr saying that will not happen? Well, even if Barr means that, good luck convincing the president of that. We saw how influential Sessions was in controlling Donald Trump's behavior. Uh, but there was another interesting uh, conversation, a bit of a back and forth that gets into other areas of concern about possible crimes that Donald Trump has committed. So there was an interaction between Senator Feinstein and Barr. Barr said the president has a right to intervene in investigations as long as he has no personal stake. He says, quote, an easy bad example would be if a member of the president's family or business associate or something was under investigation and he tries to intervene. That would be a breach of his obligation under the Constitution to faithfully execute the laws. So what about some potential hypothetical examples of that? Feinstein asks, including the emoluments clause of the Constitution. Uh, this is editorializing on the part of Raw story saying that Barr began stammering after a brief pause. Well, I think there's a dispute as to what the emoluments clause relates to. He then fiddles with his tie. I love these little additions. I have not personally researched emoluments clause. I can't tell you what it says at this point. So uh, goes on. Off the top of my head, I would have said emoluments are essentially a stipend attached to some office, but I don't know if that's correct or not. I think it's being litigated right now. So yes, there are some uh, legal cases working through that have to do with various elements of the emoluments clause. Attempts to say that Donald Trump uh, has fallen afoul of it. But here's the thing, the emoluments clause is complex and rarely adjudicated throughout the entirety of American history. And if 99.9% if .9 of the people in this country gave that response in, in re regards to a question about the emoluments clause, I, I just, I don't really know what it's about. That is totally acceptable, totally understandable. You don't need to know it. But the Attorney General does need to know it. And here's the thing, it's not just that Bill Barr wants to be the Attorney General, he already was the Attorney General 
And even then he doesn't know. And it's not like the Constitution's that long. You couldn't fit. If he had done one paragraph per year between his first term as AG and his second hypothetical term as AG, he would have easily breezed through the entirety of the Constitution. And he apparently has not been able to keep up that sort of pace of legal study in his off time. That is concerning. Overall, the responses are okay. There's one back and forth about potentially jailing reporters where he uses the term putting out stuff that will hurt the country. That's concerning, um, considering the administration's approach to you know, freedom of the media and all of that. So there's more to come. Uh, the hearings continue. We will uh, try to touch base with that a little bit later on. Uh, but so far, pretty good quotes. Who knows if it means anything? With that, we are gonna take our first break though. When we come back, Desmond Mead is gonna be joining us. He led the charge for Florida's amendment for massive amendment. We've talked about multiple times on the show. We'll be talking about that after this. We need to talk about a relatively new show called Un the Republic or UNFTR. As a Young Turks fan, you already know that the government, the media and corporations are constantly peddling lies that serve the interests of the rich and powerful. But now there's a podcast dedicated to unraveling those lies debunking the conventional wisdom. In each episode of On the Republic, or UNFTR, the host delves into a different historical episode or topic that's generally misunderstood or purposely obfuscated by the so-called powers that be, featuring in-depth research, razor-sharp commentary, and just the right amount of vulgarity, the UNFTR podcast takes a sledgehammer to what you thought you knew about some of the nation's most sacred historical cows. But don't just take my word for it. The New York Times described UNFTR as consistently compelling and educational, aiming to challenge conventional wisdom and upend the historical narratives that were taught in school. For as the great philosopher Yoda once put it, you must unlearn what you have learned. And that's true whether you're in Jedi training or you're uprooting and exposing all the propaganda and disinformation you've been fed over the course of your lifetime. So search for UNFDR in your podcast app today and get ready to get informed, angered, and entertained all at the same time. Thanks to Amendment 4 passed in last year's midterm elections, those in Florida who have prior felonies who have served their sentences now at long last have the right to vote once again. But how did we get to this point and where do we go from here? Joining us now to break it down, the leader of that movement, Desmond Mead, President and CEO of Florida Rights Restoration Coalition. Desmond, welcome to the Damage Report. John, thank you for having me. How are you? Uh, I'm I'm doing good, especially with good news coming out of Florida, like the uh, passage and implementation of uh, Amendment Four. So, uh, first of all, congratulations! I think are in order. That is a that is a big change, especially in America, to get something like that passed in the first place. Yes, and you're welcome. And it seems as if I was trying now to follow suit. So, uh, it's always a good thing when we can expand democracy and encourage other states to do the same as well. So if it's not clear to those watching, um, giving the vote back to those with prior felonies, uh, I I don't know of another case in recent history in America where that happened. In in the case of Florida, how significant is that? How big of an impact does that have on the people of Florida? Wow, John, it has a tremendous impact. When you're talking about, you know, at the time, uh, over 1.68 million uh, people living in Florida cannot vote because of a prior felony conviction. That's more people in the population of, of several states and U.S. territories, and 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 definitely over 50 countries in the world. So we accounted for at least a quarter of the total amount of people in the United States who couldn't vote because of of a, of a, a prior felony conviction. And so to be able to uh, restore the eligibility of the right to vote back to at least 1.4 million of those folks is highly uh, 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 significant, and, and, and it really can have tremendous impact on on policies that deal with reentry and criminal justice reform moving forward. So here at the Damage Report, we're very interested in people, including our viewers, uh, running for office, pushing for their own ballot measures, getting involved in democracy in a more direct fashion. So I'm curious for you, I mean, you've had a couple months now of uh, celebration, but in the years leading up to the passage of Amendment 4, how did you find yourself in the position of leading such a major campaign? Well, you know, it was because I was in the middle of it because 
was all about me and people like me. You know, as a as a person who had a previous felony conviction, you know, I ended up becoming homeless, uh, addicted to drugs, and 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 uh, standing in front of railroad tracks, getting ready to jump in front of a train. Um, train didn't come, and I I crossed the tracks, and I went into drug treatment. After completing that, I moved into a homeless shelter while there. I enrolled in school. And eventually, one thing led to another, and I ended up uh, getting a, a law degree from FIU College of Law, uh, but yet still could not practice law, still could not vote for my wife when she ran for office. And so this was an issue that I just couldn't just uh, 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 turn the switch off and go home and, and call it a day. You know, I was still waking up as one of the over a million people in Florida who was uh, disenfranchised for life. And so this became my life. And and, and because of that, uh, we learned so many uh, uh, different things along the way. And we were forced to really get a, a crash course, not only on the history uh, of fellow disenfranchisement, but the impact that it has in so many facets of our life, whether it's on our economy, whether it's on our education, whether it's on public safety, that felon disenfranchisement played a significant role. And if we could find some remedies to, to rid ourselves of these Jim Crow policies, it would be best for everyone. Well, and uh, you, you're successful uh, in this campaign, but obviously Florida continues to have massive problems with its uh, law enforcement and criminal justice systems, uh, huge inequalities, you know, terrible stories popping up on nearly a daily basis. So um, to, to the extent that you want to continue to be involved in this sort of effort, where do you go from here? Well, you know, I think that you no, know, this country got to see one of the most beautiful things on November 6th, to be honest with you. We had over 5.1 million uh, people who voted yes for Amendment 4. And that was over a million more people voted for us than voted for any candidate that was on the ballot. That showed a couple things. Number one, it showed that that this was a diverse topic that impacted people from all walks of life, and it had the support significant support from people from all walks of life, from all political persuasions. But the most, what I thought was the most important thing that it showed was those 5.1 million votes were not votes that were based on fear, neither were they votes that were based on hate, but rather there were 5.1 million votes that were based on love, forgiveness, and redemption. And what I believe is that for a fleeting moment, this country got to see love win the day on November 6th in Florida. You got to see what we're able to to what we, what we can accomplish when we can come together along the lines of humanity and transcend partisan bickering, transcend racial anxieties, and come together as a people that we are capable of moving major policy no matter what the political climate is. We've seen that in Florida, and I think that what we saw in Florida gives hope to the rest of the country about what we can do in other states. Well, let's turn now to those other states then. So uh, you made mention to uh, the numbers that Florida, I believe, was over a quarter of the disenfranchised population uh, in this particular area. So uh, how bad is the issue still remaining in other states? And uh, do you see any signs that a similar sort of amendment could potentially pass in the next few years? Well, let me tell you, so no other state was nowhere near as bad as Florida. You know, we, you know, we had uh, Kentucky was on that list. Iowa was on that list. And then some arguably would say Virginia also remains on the list of states that permanently disenfranchises American citizens. But I am encouraged off of uh, stories that I've seen come across the press as early as uh, yesterday, as late as this morning, uh, that indicated that the Iowa governor is looking to put a similar measure on the ballot before Iowa voters that will remove that lifetime ban from people with uh, former felony convictions. And so we're encouraged, you know, and we're hoping that folks would, would, would look to Florida, not only as, as a state that was able to get rid of this uh, archaic Jim Crow law or policy, but also as a state that shows how we can do it. I think to me, that's the most important thing. One of the analogies that we used to make during the campaign, we talked about moments when our country was great, when we seen the beauty of humanity was always after a natural disaster. That when, after the hurricanes ravaged the community, you seen people come together, they didn't care about how you voted in the last election. They didn't care about the color of your skin. They didn't care about how much money you made. What they seen was you was another human being in need and they came together along those lines. 
And those were the beautiful moments in our country. Those are the type of moments that we captured in our campaign. Those are the type of moments that we want to continue to promote. We don't. We shouldn't need a natural disaster to come together as a people. We should do that automatically. We should do that because we do care about our neighbors. We do care about our family members and our loved ones, and we want what's best for everyone. And so I believe that no matter what state it is, no matter what type of policy they have as it relates to uh, 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 allowing its citizens to fully engage and participate in the democratic process, I believe that we can move those issues, we can move criminal justice reform issues if we transcend Right, the division and the bickering and the hate and the fear, we could transcend that and meet in a space of love, in a space of compassion, in a space of humanity. Well, Desmond Mito, I want to thank you for joining us on the show. And again, congratulations on the passage of Amendment 4. Such a good and uh, you know, hopeful you move. Me. Thank you for having me. Thank Appreciate you. Appreciate it. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, Donald Trump obviously still engaged in a shutdown fight now, spreading easily disprovable lies about undocumented immigrants. We will reveal the truth after this. So we are, as you can see down there, in day 25 of the shutdown. And honestly, as the days go by, it doesn't really seem to be swinging in the favor of Donald Trump. That is borne out by a couple of different polls, which we'll talk about. He knows this, he follows polls and ratings and things like that far more than anyone else does. And as he starts to feel less and less in control of this situation, he starts to lash out in ever increasingly ridiculous ways. And we're gonna have an example of that in just a little bit, a video of him spreading an insane lie about undocumented immigrants, something that in a second or two on Google you can find out is not the case. But I wanna talk about why exactly he might be sort of stretching more and more to make the case for why we need a wall and all the other things that he wants to stop the shutdown. Um, there's a Quinnipiac poll, and it references the address that he gave to the nation last week. Now, in advance of that address, I admit, and I think I said on the show that day, that I was at least a little bit nervous that this primetime address by the president with flags in the background and the Oval Office and all of that, and him being on a teleprompter, and uh, you know, people controlling it very carefully could potentially maybe swing some people, or even if it doesn't swing people, scare the Democrats into complying with his wishes. Um, turns out that did not actually happen because when asked in a Quinnipiac poll, quote, did President Trump's recent televised address to the nation change your mind about building a wall along the border with Mexico or not? Only 2% said yes, while 89% said no, and the remaining 9% hadn't heard enough or didn't answer, which to me reads as no. So 2% changed their mind based on Donald Trump's address, which sounds bad for the president, but it's actually a little bit worse than it sounds because they didn't ask in what direction it changed their mind. It just says, did you change your mind? Do we assume that all of them now support his position? What he said was reprehensible and easily disprovable. It is possible that it swung some people against him. Now, uh, diving in just a little bit deeper, what do people actually think about the border and the wall and how they want the shutdown resolved? Uh, 59 to 40% said that the wall would not be a good use of taxpayer dollars. 55 to 43% said the wall would not make the US safer. 59 to 40% said that the wall is not necessary to protect the border. 52% said it's against American values. And 41% said it's consistent with American values, or at least some version of them. So all of the various arguments for the wall uh, don't bear out. I mean, look, obviously it's a waste of money. That seems like it would be pretty easy to get people to agree to. But does it make America safer? I could see a lot of people being fooled into thinking that that would actually make a difference. It's a wall after all. You can't run through it, as Trump says, or something. Um, I could see that that would convince people, but apparently it has not. And the counter argument, even as I would say weakly or sporadically made as it is by Democratic leadership, is still winning out decisively. So that is not working in Donald Trump's favor. And then we get to where he turns from here. And so he's made the case in terms of crime and duct tape and unbelievable vehicles and turning left at the border. But now what about when they get here? Do they comply with our legal system? Here is what he said yesterday. Somebody comes into our country, they touch one foot on the ground and we have to catch them. It's called catch. We then take their names and we bring them to a court. Can you believe this? And we release them. 
But see, we're trying to do catch and hold, catch and not release. But you have to release. So we release. And they go into our country. And then you announce, these are the laws. Then you say, come back in three years for your trial. Tell me, what percentage of people come back? Would you say 100%? No, you're a little off. Like, how about 2%? And those people you almost don't want because they cannot be very smart. 2%. 2%. come back. Those 2% are not going to make America great again. It's called catch. <laughs> yeah. Okay, and then what we want to do is catch and hold, which sounds... That just sounds like catch again, honestly. It sounds better. It sounds a little bit more sophisticated, but it still sounds like you're talking about catch. Um, okay, so then he moves on from all that stuff to uh, the numbers. Tell me, what percent do you think would come back? It's like 2%. Now, he asks what seems to be a rhetorical question of the audience, but I'm not sure that it was rhetorical. I think this is how he actually learns about things. He asks audiences because it's not 2%. It's not close to 2%. Politico citing Justice Department data reports that around 60 to 75% of non-detained migrants have attended their immigration court proceedings. So he's off by a bit from two, as high as 75%. And the thing is, I've looked at the numbers per year. Now it turns out it has gone up slightly over the past couple of years, the percentage that do not report. It's still around three quarters report or close to three quarters. It was significantly higher, actually, just a few years before. It was like 80, 90 percent. It turns out that the sort of migrants who are coming are slightly different. Their fears about being deported are slightly different, and that is largely due to sort of civil wars and disturbances inside of their countries, like insecurity, basically, in their countries. That again, not only have we not as a country done much to help resolve that situation or deal with the migrants once they leave there, but we can, of course, historically be traced to much of the economic and military instability that led to those situations in the first place. That is a bit of degree. We don't have much time for it, but his numbers could not be more off. And then the argument he makes about it is those people, do we really want them? They can't be that smart. And then uproarious laughter from the audience. Those people who are told that they're supposed to come to a court and they do it. They abide by the law, those dummies. And the people in the audience don't realize what they're actually laughing at. What they're laughing at is that their president thinks people who abide by the law are stupid. And they think that is funny. Yeah, why would you want to abide by the law? Again, this is the party of law and order. This is the party of stability. People who abide by the law are dumb people. Well, maybe someday Donald Trump will get to see whether he appears at court or runs or something like that. Um, this would seem to imply that he will do one rather than the other. Uh, by the way, it turns out it's actually worse than what he said in terms of the numbers. In one particular case, so there had been an Obama era program that released asylees from detention and matched them with case managers who encouraged compliance with court ordered obligations. So this was in the case of families. They had this test program where they released people, told them when they needed to come back, but also had people check in on them. That seems like a good program. It turns out that before the Trump administration ended that program in June of last year, participants had a 100% attendance rate at court hearings. They also had a 99% rate of check-ins and appointments with Immigration and Customs Enforcement. That is according to the Department of Homeland Security. So that is a program that if you wanted these people to actually come in without having to hold them for literally years, keeping families in detention, ruining their lives, and costing the taxpayer huge quantities of money, you could do this with case managers and you would get something like a 99 to 100% compliance rate. But did Donald Trump mention that as a little address there? Of course not. It didn't even make up 2% of his remarks there at that speech, even though you would think that people would really like to know this information. Anyway, I wish that we had time to move on to Steve King. Perhaps we'll do it a little bit later. We do have to take our second break, but stick around because on the other side of this break, we're gonna be joined from the field by a teacher engaged in LA's massive teacher strike going on right now. We're gonna break down why they're striking, what they hope to get after this. It is day two of LA's massive teacher strikes. Over 33,000 teachers off the job, demanding smaller school sizes, higher pay, more resources to do their job. And we are very lucky right now in the Damage Report to be joined live from the field at the California Charter Schools Association. Judy Artiaga is joining us now. Hi, John. 
Uh, hey, hey, Judy, how's it going? We're very excited to have you here. Uh, so you're a teacher at the strike right now, and uh, I, I want to better understand what it is that the teachers are asking for and why it is that the school district has uh, so far held firm against those demands. So uh, could you sum up for people who might not be familiar, uh, what are you, uh, LA's teachers want? I'd be happy to. So LA teachers are asking for the resources to best support our students. We're asking for things like a reduced class size. We're asking for things like nurses on each of our campuses and more mental health and counseling support staff to help our most at risk students. So uh, that all seems very reasonable to reasonable people, I think. Uh, I am curious because I've heard a lot about um, the, what the, the teachers are asking for in terms of pay. And often there is reference to uh, the rising cost of simply living in LA. So as a teacher that has been teaching here for some time, how have things changed financially in your time as a teacher in Southern California? So in my time as a teacher, our salaries have not grown to match the cost of living in Los Angeles. So for instance, just to rent apartments in Los Angeles is very expensive. And the salaries that the district paid really don't match our ability to meet the rising cost of real estate or living in Southern California. Um, be it LA or even moving further out as far as an hour away, which many of our teachers do just so that they can afford a place to live. Yeah, which means that already long working days are expanded by uh, by long commutes as well. Uh, I can yeah. see behind you uh, marchers going on there, and so um, I, I'm sure that that you teachers were hoping that it would not come to this, that you would have to be in the streets. Um, are you are you mentally, physically prepared for perhaps an extended strike? How long do you see this uh, taking? Obviously, we hope the strike is resolved as quickly as possible, but we're not willing to concede to the demands of the Los Angeles Unified School District in terms of shortchanging our students. Um, we are definitely prepared for this. This is something that we've anticipated coming for upwards of a year and a half, um, just because we have been without a contract for that period of time. And so we've really been aware that this is a distinct possibility, especially given our superintendent at this point. Have you heard anything about uh, negotiations being started back up? I mean, I know that the strike started because they had failed, but now that you guys are out there, you're doing this, do we have any idea that, that the, uh, the talks might have resumed? As of right now, we have not heard any information that would indicate these talks have resumed. Um, definitely not yesterday and definitely not today is my understanding. So I am curious, from what you have heard, in terms of the parents of the kids, are they largely supportive of what the teachers are asking for? How do they actually view this strike? Definitely, what parent wouldn't want to make sure their child is safe at school and has resources like a nurse or a smaller class size. So our parents are very supportive. If you look at the students that even attended school yesterday, less than a third of the district students even went to school. We have parents that march with us on the picket lines. We have parents that are bringing us supplies, coffee, donuts. Um, all these things kind of bolster our membership and keep us going and really show their support for the strike and for their students. So I don't know if you've seen, but on the show yesterday when we were talking about the strike, there's a few national politicians that have come out in support of the strikes. I mean, fairly obvious names when it comes to these sorts of economic issues. Do you expect that this sort of strike happening as it is with such large numbers and in one of the largest cities, obviously, in the country, do you expect that this could become a national issue or at the very least a state issue? Do you think that Gavin Newsom might get involved at some point? Definitely could see national involvement and state involvement, especially. Um, Eric Garcetti has already gone on the record and asked to make sure that there's bargaining as it should be conducted and that both parties are not bargaining in the media. Um, Facebook Live isn't a way to conduct bargaining that's sustainable for our district. So um, we have his involvement. We know that Gavin Newsom is aware of the situation and we have great allies nationally as well in Kamala Harris and Alexandra Cortez. So we know that there are people who are fighting for us both nationally and at the state level. And now uh, over, especially the last year, I mean, there's a bit of a history going back, but but last year there were large scale uh, teacher strikes in a number of different states. And although they were not all uniformly successful, there were some big cases where they, they held strong against you know, vicious attacks against them. And in the end, they did get what they wanted. Um, in the lead up to this strike, did those examples from other states, did that provide any sort of inspiration or you know willingness to engage in this sort of thing? Seeing it be successful in these other cases? Definitely. And I'm 
We know that we're proud to be part of the Red for Ed movement. We're proud to join with our union brothers and sisters and non-union brothers and sisters in the number of those states to really support public education and to make sure that people are aware of the deficiencies that exist in our schools um, because of the lack of funding. For instance, here in Los Angeles, you can have a, a science classroom that has 50 students in it. That's not uncommon. And that type of thing is happening all over the country. And to be able to stand up and to say that this is enough, we need to draw the line somewhere and that we as teachers are willing to take that stand and to fight for what's right for our students. So uh, for those who might be watching this that live in LA or Southern California or even around the country, uh, if they are supportive of your movement, uh, what would you suggest that they do to, to show support to make it more likely that the teachers union is successful in its uh, demands? The best way they can show their support is by reaching out to their elected representatives and the people that represent them. In LA, they can talk to their school board member. In the statewide, they can talk to Tony Thurman, their uh, superintendent of schools. They can talk to Gavin Newsom, and they can reach out to these people to make sure that they know that this is an important issue for the people in Los Angeles and that starving our public schools is not something that's sustainable and not something that's going to be okay with the citizens of LA, California, and nationally. Yeah. Well, Judy Arteaga, thank you so much for joining us, especially on short notice. Uh, good luck in the strike and uh, try to stay warm out there. Thank you, I appreciate it, it was a pleasure to be here. Thank you. Uh, we're gonna take one last break, we come back, two big stories I wanna get to. So Steve King obviously made big news just a few days ago with his comments about white supremacy. We have been waiting to see some sort of negative consequences. We now actually have them. And after that, Gillette has come out with an ad, surprisingly controversial after this. Okay, I have been advised that there is no time to get through all the material we have to, so I'm gonna jump right into it. Just a couple of days ago, Steve King gave an interview with the New York Times where he asked what all the fuss was about white supremacy. When did that become offensive, he wanted to know. And uh, the media largely ignored it. They didn't, they didn't really seem to care that a sitting congressman was defending the concept of white supremacy as being non-offensive in some way. And they largely didn't talk about it, and we've covered that previously. But now, thanks to some outspoken politicians like Alexandria Ocasio-Cortez and others, we have consequences in terms of people denouncing him, which I don't really care about, and actual consequences, which I do. So let's start with those. Uh, King was actually removed from all of his committee assignments, which is sort of a big deal in the House. King had been a member of a number of House committees, including the House Agriculture Committee and the House Judiciary Committee, where he served as the chair of the subcommittee on the Constitution and Civil Justice, which let's just pause for one second. How was that the case even before that quote? What is it, like the, the subcommittee of irony <laughs> that he's the civil justice guy? The we can't save our civilization with other people's babies guy? The I will go out of my way to promote politicians in Canada and Europe only because they are ultra nationalist? Nobody else even knows who they are, but I'm in favor of them. He was the, the civil justice guy? Man, our country is really something, but he has been stripped of those. And for a congressperson, especially someone in the minority, that now means he's sort of still in Congress, I guess. I mean, he's you know influential, he can vote and stuff. But in terms of pushing for legislation, he doesn't really have much of a say in legislation until the final vote, and now they're in the minority, so that doesn't really matter. Um, so that's a pretty big change. Um, that was the members of the Republican Steering Committee who voted unanimously to do that. Now, assuming they don't immediately backtrack and let him back on or wait three weeks and then do it, that is bold, I would say. That's a, that's a big change. Um, you know, they, they didn't force him out of the House entirely, but they, they constrained him quite a bit. That's a, a bit of a, a kneecapping. So uh, some people are very, very happy about this. Of course, as we said previously, AOC had been pushing for some sorts of consequences. She said, freedom of speech does not mean freedom from consequences. King's district should start working to replace him in 2020. Regardless of party, it's not good for a district if their rep has such a re reprehensible views that they aren't allowed to touch legislation with a 10 foot pole. And he is indeed already likely to be primary. There's a person who's already talking about primarying him in this next election. Um, others are coming out of the woodworks to finally attack him. Uh, Mitt Romney wants him to step down. Bold move from Mitt Romney. Now it's actually, it's something because he was one of the early ones. So I'll give him that and nothing else. Uh, but even Mitch McConnell says, I have no tolerance for such positions. And those who espouse these views are not supporters of American ideals and freedoms. Now, let me go back to supporting Donald Trump. 
Okay, so I guess not some consistency really, but he did actually speak out against Steve King, and uh, that's good. I mean, there's competition amongst Democrats to uh, get a censure resolution uh, forward. Uh, Jim Clyburn is gonna offer his own resolution of disapproval. Um, in terms of the House, this is actually quite a bit of action and is good to see. Now, he has responded and defended himself saying, Leader McCarthy's decision to remove me from committees is a political decision that ignores the truth. Clearly, I was only referencing Western civilization classes. No one ever sat in a class listening to the merits of white nationalism and white supremacy. When I used the word that, it was in reference only to Western civilization and not to any previously stated evil ideology, all of which I have denounced. Which I sort of, I get what he's saying. I would say that if you were only referencing one thing rather than all three, I would have made that clear in the first four days after it became a big issue. It's weird to wait until uh, this final point. And again, we already know who this person is from so many different words and actions in this area. It makes his apology a little bit harder to swallow. Now we have to continue to see if he's eventually re-elevated to his same position. We also will have to watch to see as the primary goes on. But so far, this is actually surprising action from the Republicans in the House. And moving on to other news. We don't often talk about Gillette on this channel, but we have to today because they came out with an ad that has blown up skulls around the country. Let's take a look. Bullying. The Me the Too movement against sexual Toxic harassment. masculinity. Is this the best a man can get? Is it? We can't laugh it off. Who's the daddy? <laughs> what I actually think she's trying to say. Making the same old excuses. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. Boys will be boys. But something finally changed. Allegations regarding sexual assault and sexual harassment. Oh, yes. But she says he's no, 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 no. And there will be no going back. Because we, we believe in the best in men. Men need to hold other men accountable. Smile, sweetie. Come on. To say the right thing, to act the right uh, way. Bro, not cool, not cool. Some already are. In ways big Yo, men, for everyone. and small. I am strong. I am strong. It's not how we treat each other, okay? Okay. Because the boys watching today. So first off, let me say that uh, you know credit to them for making this ad, which is sure to generate controversy, which sort of would help them out. So perhaps a little bit less credit. Other than the credit that they were willing to do this in the first place, I don't care when gigantic corporations get involved in this stuff. I mean, it doesn't matter. It has nothing to do with shaving. It has nothing to do with Gillette shaving in particular. I don't care too much about the Gillette angle of this. Now they do say that beyond just this ad, they're going to put money into projects to inspire and educate men of all ages and challenge male stereotypes. We'll see if they actually do that. I'm gonna talk about this ad. I don't care about the corporate side. I don't wanna get involved with that. But the reaction is interesting because people have freaked out about this. And it's not surprisingly right wingers who say, how dare they continue their global war on masculine? Anna, what? Why is she on the damage port? <laughs> okay, so Anna Gasparian was in the video. I was, sh I just started watching that video, and I was like, is that Anna? That's weird. I guess we're we're going, we're we're a little bit more credible now. We're showing up in commercials, but back to the reaction. They insist on the right that this is part of the SJW feminazi war on men, and the thing is. I know that right wing guys don't like this, but I'm a guy and you don't speak for me and I am not in any way threatened by this at all. What I am threatened by is the sort of pervasive weakness and fear that typifies right wing masculinity. I find that to be pathetic sort of objectively. I don't even think it's really an opinion at this point. And I think that being freaked out by an ad like this does not make any sense whatsoever. Now, if you don't wanna buy Gillette razors because of this, you can engage in a boycott if you want to. You can shave with whatever you want, you can not shave at all if you want to. But to get freaked out about it by is a, little bit, is a little bit ridiculous. And I would say if you are gonna be freaked out by it, you can either be freaked out by it or continually attack snowflakes. But if you were freaked out by this ad, so much so that you're tweeting constantly and like Piers Morgan, his entire life is about this ad right now, I think you understand the impetus 
to do things that you define as snowflake behavior a little bit better than you like to imply that you do. I don't have time to go more in depth in terms of right wing masculinity. I've always had a problem with, with it and the way it is portrayed in the media. We will talk more about that in the future, but give the ad a try. There's more to it than just what we showed. We'll talk about this a little bit more later on in the week, perhaps. That's all the time we have, unfortunately. Thank you for joining us this on this episode. We'll be checking in more with the shutdown and with a teacher strike as we go on through this week. Thank you for watching. We'll be back tomorrow morning with much more news for you. Thanks for listening to the full episode of The Damage Report. Support our work, listen ad-free, access members-only bonus content, and more by subscribing to Apple Podcasts at apple.co slash TYT. I'm your host, John Adarola. I'll see you soon.